is January Jones. She is not a young, beautiful, talented actress on Mad Men. She is not an older, gorgeous, exotic dancer from the Johnny Carson Show. She is an author, and she wrote, Thou Shall Not Wine, The Eleventh Commandment, that reached number one at Amazon.com. She is a reality TV golf personality with World High Stakes Golf televised on HDNet. She is a humorist and winologist expert. She is your featured host today on January Success Stories. So sit back, relax, and get ready to laugh and listen to Ms. Jones with her eclectic roster of guests as you learn life's lessons. These stories plus sharing equals success. Welcome and remember, beware because you are entering the no whining world of January Jones. Welcome everyone. I'm January Jones and this is my co-host. Her name is Ginger Ale and she's our new five month old puppy. She'll be back for the closing segment. And uh, if she's not sleeping or doing the other things puppies do, there she goes. <laughs> now for my audience, let me ask you a question. Would you like to learn more about what it's like to be an author in your golden years? Have you ever wondered what it would be like to write your own memoir? Well, I don't have to wonder because I'm working on mine. And I'll tell you, it's the hardest thing I've ever tried to write in my entire life. It, the hard part is that at 78 years, you have to try to be honest. <laughs> and when you look back on your memories, sometimes honesty is the most difficult policy. Would you like to meet someone who has actually created a new career in his senior moment? Are you ready to make some big changes in your life and learn some helpful lessons? If you can answer yes or maybe to any of these questions, then you are in the right place. And I would like to welcome you to January Jones Sharing Success Stories. So now it's time to sit back, relax, go get some wine, cheese, and crackers so you can join me in the no wine zone. Now let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. Well, actually, our lead-in, you may notice I'm wearing an oxygen tube. When I invited our wonderful guest on the show today, he said, well, I don't know if you want me on a TV show because I'm on oxygen. And I said, wow, yes, I definitely want you on my show because guess what? I'm on oxygen too. And it's something that seniors can relate to. So I hope you enjoy <laughs> our oxygen show today. My guest completed his bachelor and master's degrees in fine art and began teaching art in colleges in Texas. He later completed the Doctor of Education at Illinois State University. He taught in liberal arts colleges before becoming director of an art school in upstate New York for the last 20 years of his college work. His first book was a memoir, The Boy on Shady Grove Road. It's part of a story of his life as a child growing up in a dirt farm in Arkansas the book details how he was raised by parents with little money, lots of love, and times were hard for the family, but they made it through. It's my pleasure to welcome to the show today, Clyde McCauley. Hi, Clyde. How are you doing today, dear? Hi, hi, January. I'm great. I uh, appreciate you wearing your tube today, too. Uh, <laughs> you didn't have to do that for me, but I, uh, since I developed pul pulmonary fibrosis, I do have to wear mine now. So I'm kind of limited, but I'm tickled to death to be with you on your show today. 
Oh, I'm happy to have you. <laughs> and, you know, actually, I'm a kind of a little bit of a fake here because I only wear my tube at night. Oh, but, no. uh, but for you, I would wear it during the day. I'd do anything for you, dear. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> it's so exciting to have you back and help well, me start you. this new live talk for TV network. I'll be doing this podcast live every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So just go to talk4tv.com and tune in throughout the year. Clyde, it's so nice to have you back with us to share your success story. Um, you know, the question I have for you is the one about writing a memoir. How did you approach it? How long did it take you to do it? And what are your thoughts about it? Okay. Well, <clears throat> my kids had always told me, you know, I used to tell them some little stories about my childhood as I was, as they were growing up. And so mm -hmm. they're both grown now, of course, and even have children, both of them. And, uh, and I have grandchildren from them. And so anyway, they said, dad, would you write their stories? We'd like to hear those stories. We'd love to hear them. But so I decided, well, I'll just sit down and start doing it. So I kind of wrote them in just little stories from what I remembered. And that's the good thing about a memoir is it's your story. So, <laughs> you know, nobody really knows everything that's, it's correct about it except you so i started writing these stories and mm -hmm. i don't know i probably did the book for six months or so and pulled it all together and uh and i got it published and uh then started trying to sell it some so <clears throat> and then i started doing some book signings and all those kind of things <clears throat> so what do you uh i find it very hard i'm working on mine and i'm about three-fourths through uh -huh. The hard part is when you do this, you have to commit to being totally, truly honest. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes that's pretty hard to do, don't yeah. you think? <laughs> yes, that's really true. And, you know, everyone should try writing their story. I, I really encourage people to, on my uh, Facebook and so forth, I encourage people to write their stories for themselves and for their kids and their whoever comes after them, they should know your story. Whether you sell it or not, it's not even important at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at this point in your life, you don't have to depend on a book, hopefully. So, but it's nice to have the story that they can read. Yeah, for sure. Tell me, uh, how did your, uh, your friends and family in your hometown, how did they react to you writing the story of yourself and your town? How did that go over? Well, <clears throat> I'd published <clears throat> the book and, and I got a phone call one day <clears throat> from a man that worked at the uh, local newspaper. And he said, uh, you know, I'm from the local newspaper here where you were raised. And he said, I'd like to see if you would consider coming down to Benton, Arkansas and doing some book signings for us and, uh, you know, read your book. And we'd all love to hear from you. I thought, well, that'd be great. Well, you know, we should do that. So my wife and I got in our car and loaded our books up and we went to Benton, Arkansas. And <laughs> we had a great time. Oh, I was like a, I was like a rock star. You would have thought, you know, I mean, anybody that, that had written a book, you know, you are next to God and rock star, at least, you know. So it was funny, but I mean, I'm teasing there a little bit, but yeah. I had a lot of fun with it. The The audiences were great. Uh, you know, I met old friends that I'd gone to school with. Some of us remembered things from each other and some of us didn't remember even <laughs> each other. And it was kind of fun, but we had a good time. And I was very well received. Uh -huh. So... And then you were, I understand that you were presented the Arkansas Traveler Award by the governor of the state. How exciting is that? Yeah, okay. I even have it for you to show you if you, I can try to hold it up here. See. Oh, wonderful. Great. It says the Arkansas Traveler. Uh -huh. And it says that I'm a, an ambassador for the oh. state now. Uh -huh. And this is not given to that many people. I think they've only given it to about 60 recipients since it was. Again, Eleanor, uh, not Eleanor, uh, Franklin Eleanor Roosevelt was mm -hmm. the first one to receive this award. And oh. Reagan has gotten it, and you know, Dell Evans, and Roy Rogers, and Gene Autry, and, <laughs> and lots of people, including Claude. And I was just shocked because I don't fit in with all those other people at all. But anyway, I was given the award, and it was presented by the one of the uh, senators of the state, or representative, and he did it on behalf of the governor. So I was oh. thrilled. And they all thought that you know, I was really a rock star. <clears throat> <laughs> well, I couldn't think of a better ambassador for Arkansas than you. Oh, now, pr 
prior to writing, you were a visual artist. Yes. So was it difficult to make the transition from visual art to writing? Tell us how that went for well, you. <clears throat> I'd always been a visual artist. I started off painting and that type of thing, and then went into some sculpture, and then did some filmmaking toward the end, and, and got into photography more. And mm -hmm. uh, so once I got to the point where it was getting too hard for me to go out and photograph because of my pulmonary fibrosis, I thought, well, I should try. I guess I should get on to writing this book and doing that. So I started doing that. And actually, January, I found that <clears throat> I was getting the same feelings of uh, appreciation of, of creativity as I was doing these, writing these books as I was when I was painting or photographing or whatever. I was still feeling the creative thing happening. And it's so neat because I didn't know that could happen from one medium over to another. <clears throat> but I just found that it did. I was getting the same type of satisfaction from putting painting words instead of painting the mm -hmm. painting on canvas. And so I started doing that, not knowing, I mean, I'm not a great writer, so don't misunderstand me. I don't claim to be, but I've been having myself a good time in my old age. <laughs> well, I definitely can relate to it because as you know, I've written too. I know. And uh, right now I'm gonna promote my first book that I wrote when I was 50 years old, mm -hmm. Thou Shalt Not Wine, the 11th commandment. Lately, there's a whining epidemic in our world. People are even whining about whining. Are you sick and tired of listening to everyone whining all the time? So was January Jones, the author of Thou Shall Not Whine, the 11th commandment that reached number one at Amazon.com. Ms. Jones based her book on a survey of the top 10 things that people whine about at all ages and all stages of life. January is a success coach that can tell you how to help others. When you buy Thou Shalt Not Whine, the 11th commandment, you'll find out what people whine about and how to stop them from whining. This is the perfect gift book to give or get for any occasion. Thou Shall Not Wine was voted the best gift to be given anonymously for those special people in your life. Ms. Jones is an internationally known author in the style of Irma Bombeck, specializing in housewife humor with her book being published in Korea and China. You can find Thou Shall Not Wine at Amazon.com. Welcome back to the No Wine Zone with my guest, Clyde McCauley, who is definitely not a whiner. Uh, <laughs> he is a true winner. And Clyde, before we go on with the interview, could you share contact information for our fans, how they can uh, go to your website, how they can buy your books? And I know you have a special <clears throat> offer for them today, too. Yes. Uh the, the probably the easiest way for you to find is to go to my website. It's in, it's called Mama's White Gravy dot com. It's M A M A S Mama's White W H I T E Gravy G R A V Y uh, dot com. Great Mama's White Gravy dot com, and they can see all my books there and about podcasts and everything else. And uh, another site is Clyde dot com, but uh, Mama's White Gravy will give you probably the best one. And of course, you can go to Amazon and just type in uh, under books, Clyde McCauley, uh, and they should come up and show you all in there. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question <laughs> about Mama's White Gravy. Yeah. <laughs> Was this served on everything you ate in Arkansas? <laughs> well, we, when, you're, when you're poor and you don't have a lot to eat, uh, mm -hmm. flour and milk uh, makes gravy, and so does it make biscuits and you know, so you eat a lot of biscuits and gravy and that type of thing. And I love my mother's white gravy. So <laughs> I was raised on it not knowing it was poor man's food. I thought it was delicious food. And uh -huh. so when I went to name this little thing, I just thought, I'll honor my mother by calling it Mama's White Gravy. So if you go to <laughs> mamaswhitegravy.com, you'll find me. Uh, wonderful. I, I, I loved your book. And I was particularly enchanted with your relationship with your nephew, Kenny. And you share so many stories about adventures that you and Kenny had together. I, I know he has passed, but what a wonderful memory you must have of him. Yes, we were raised like brothers. He was just three years younger than me. My oldest sister 
<clears throat> they had a child and, and uh, it was Kenny. Uh, but I was the last of, of six kids. I was the last one born eight years after the rest of, so all the rest of my uh, family were pretty much ahead of me. So Kenny came along just perfect time for me. Uh, yeah. yeah. My, my husband has a, a nephew that is uh, seven years younger than him. His sister had a child very close okay. to his age. And they have a really close bond uh, through the years. And even now, we still get to have visits with him, and we love being with him. Yeah. Now, tell, tell us what it's like for you to come on these podcasts and share your memories. Is this a uh, positive thing for you to do or do you hesitate? Is it difficult? Well, <clears throat> I did it <clears throat> for a short time. I was not interviewing people. I was just doing a little short stories about Arkansas <clears throat> and things the way it were, the way they were when I grew up and so forth. And so, you know, I had a few thousand people that were following them, but you know, not a big following of people, but I had fun doing it. And it's getting difficult now for me with my voice to even speak. So uh, I'm having a little trouble today, but I think I'll get through the hour. And uh, <laughs> so but I'm kind of not doing it. But you go and hear about 30 of them or, of them or whatever. Uh, on my Mama's White Gravy, you'll see uh, how to get that to the podcast link for that. So and they're kind of fun to listen to. You know how, uh, you know, when they were having a baptism in the Wirt River when I was a kid and uh, they were... <laughs> And the snake came in, snake came in the river and drove, drove everybody out of the river. Yeah, I mean, there's so many fun stories like that. Yeah. You know, the time we fell in the well, and just lots of fun, fun things. <laughs> well, I've read, I've read the book, and it is a most uh, enjoyable book. And it's a wonderful picture of times when life was simpler. Yeah. And things were, you know, I think things were a little more black and white. Life was a lot easier than, in my opinion. What do you think? Oh, I think so, definitely. I mean, even though times were hard for us, you know, mm -hmm. we didn't have, well, until I was six years old, didn't have running, I mean, didn't have electricity. Then in all my youth, I didn't have running water in the house. So mm -hmm. we had an outdoor toilet and all that. And those times were hard, but not like the mess that we're in right now, you know. And I feel, oh, there's so many kids, I just see them on the phones. You know, they don't ever put them down. They're always holding them and doing things with them. Are uh -huh. looking at the, the games on the video, and I just think they are missing out on so much that we had such a good time out in the wilds, running out in the fields, and you know, flying kites and you know, chasing animals. What did we did? We just had a blast all the time, yeah. And, and as growing up now, as far as the white community and the black community. Did they have an overlap or was it an easier relationship then than it is now for people? <clears throat> well, it was very different. We, there was definitely separation. Uh, there was <clears throat> on one side of the tracks were the whites on the north side. On the south side of the tracks were the blacks. We mm -hmm. called them Negroes then. Uh, mm -hmm. and many people call them worse, of course. But uh, when I grew up, there was, no, there was not the tension. I mean, we didn't feel the tension. Now, maybe... The black people, I sure felt the tension, but mm -hmm. I didn't feel the kind of tension that we're feeling now at all. So um, even though my dad was a segregated segregationist, he still had black friends that he would have come in and have dinner at our house. And mm -hmm. that was fine because they were special to him. I can't explain it. And people down south, they were born and raised in it. And so many times they never, unfortunately, asked the questions that they mm -hmm. should ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we need a lot more of that now with people reaching out to each other and trying to uh, <clears throat> accept and understand what other people went through at times. You know, yes. I, I went to, I was raised in the North. However, I went to live in the South when I was uh, 20. I went to fly for Eastern Airlines. Yeah. And so we flew through all the small towns, uh, Charlotte and uh, all the small towns in the South and people there were just incredibly wonderful and welcoming. And we would have uh, interaction with everyone, white, black. We never knew the difference. Everyone was just so, come on over to our place and they'd yeah. serve us dinner. <clears throat> it was a special yeah. time at, you know, then. I, I was raised the time though when there were, Separate drinking fountains for blacks and whites, separate uh -huh. restaurants, separate bathrooms, 
uh, all of that things changing didn't change a lot of it then until almost the mid 60s to tell you the truth <clears throat> uh, yeah and that's about when i started flying about 63 64 now you're writing a series of children's middle grade books tell me about them and what did you base them on did you base them on your childhood well uh when i did the book on my own childhood uh, you know a memoir i had a lot of people say to me do you have any more stories that you could write like that? You know, and I said, well, I've told you my stories, but I got thinking maybe I should try to write some stories. I'd always fantasized living in the Appalachian Mountains as a child. Okay. Now, I did live near there in my 20s, uh, just uh, more west over toward, more toward Nashville area. But uh, uh, I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to write a series of, I mean, write a book. I'm going to just start off with a book. Write a book about, about uh, kids growing up like Kenny and I did in Arkansas, up in the mountains, up on the ridge, Pan Panther Creek Mountain Ridge. And I will see all these ex exciting things that they do like Kenny and I used to do. Well, I started writing some. And I thought I should get some uh, middle grade kids to come in and kind of review me a little bit and see what, critique me and tell me how I'm doing. So <laughs> I, had a couple, I had a couple of neighbor kids. I had these two boys. They come in over to our house and I'd give them the, chapters to read that I'd already read, written. And so they came over and they said, Clyde, we see one problem with the book. And I said, what? These are kids, 10, oh, 11 years old. They said, you don't have any girls in the book. It's just, <laughs> it's just boys. And I thought, wow, I didn't thought of that. And they said, you know, you should have girls in the book because keep in mind, girls buy books too, they said. So, <laughs> of course. They, I said, well, these guys, I should write, hire for my, you know, my business manager and my advertising design people or something. But anyway, I thought, well, you know, that's a good idea. So I wrote back, went back and I wrote Sally Jane, a cousin that moved into their community because uh -huh. their, her father died and she and her mother moved up on the mountain next to the boys. And so they had a blast up there, all kinds of adventures. <clears throat> so anyway, that led to a second book and then a third book and then a fourth book. And so the other books are smaller. The first one was pretty thick because I was planning on it being only one book. But then I decided to make it into a little series of books. So these uh -huh. kids had a blast. They they just did everything. everything. And the last book ends up where the, <laughs> their, their, their secret cave, they find Bigfoot. Bigfoot. And so oh, okay. Bigfoot and Mrs. Bigfoot and and young Bigfoot. So anyway, that, there's lots of exciting stories in this. It would make a great TV series, I think. Kind of reminds oh. me in some way of the Waltons. Remember? Was it with oh. The Waltons? Oh, yeah. They uh, were wonderful. They'd, I loved that show. And they'd yeah. always say good night to each other. Yeah. Good night, John. Boy. Yeah. Good night, John Boy. <laughs> yeah. Good night. <laughs> you know, right now I'm going to share a commercial about Who Killed Kennedy. And these are two books that I wrote. And uh, who do you think had the motive, the money? and the means to commit the perfect crime of the last century. Let me ask you a question. Are you still wondering who killed Kennedy? Over 50 years later, the assassination is still a mystery. It is unfinished business for our country. Now get ready for a theory that you've never heard before, but will make more sense than any other conspiracy theory that you've ever heard in the past. January Jones speaks the unspeakable in her book, Jackie, Ari, and Jack, The Tragic Love Triangle, connecting Jackie and Aristotle Onassis romantically prior to JFK's assassination. Did you know that Ari was Jackie's guest in the White House during the JFK funeral? He was the only non-family member who was invited by Jackie to stay there during the funeral. Aristotle Onassis was one of the wealthiest men in the world, with the means, the motive, and the money to order an assassination that was the perfect crime of the last century. Ari needed class, and Jackie needed cash. They were perfect for each other. Now, what is Camelot? It is but another tragic love triangle. Jackie, Ari, and Jack is available at JanuaryJones.com, Amazon.com, and Audiobooks.com, read by Ms. Jones.
Welcome back with my wonderful guest, Clyde McCauley, sharing his success story. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you have a large following on Facebook, of which I'm one of your followers. Yes. And uh, have you ever involved uh, your followers in your writing world? Have you ever given them a challenge? Uh, yes, I have. I, <clears throat> I started off uh, just encouraging them to write, you know, little memoirs and little stories and so forth. And mm -hmm. so I was trying to think, how can I get some involved? So uh, first of all, I had read about six word stories. Uh, the most famous one, of course, was Ernest Hemingway's, Ernest Hemingway that said, uh, here was his six word story. It said, uh, baby shoes for sale, baby shoes never worn. Those <laughs> six words. Now that you could go all directions with that, you know, in those six words, you know, mm -hmm. was it was there miscarriage? Did the baby die if he was born? On and on and on. So uh, <laughs> I started challenging some of them to write six word stories. Well, they started sending them in. And, you know, mm -hmm. some were much better than others, but some were pretty doggone good. And so <laughs> they were allowed only six words. That's it. So you need to, you know, you need to set the story up and tell something about it and come to a little conclusion if you can, all in six words. Not easy to do. <laughs> so. I know it's not easy to do because I've taken up the challenge. <laughs> yes, yes. I agree and it, it. And yeah. it, it's very addictive, isn't it? It is. They started, well, people started doing it and then they started writing to me. You know, I can't even go into wash my dishes without thinking six word <laughs> stories as I'm in there washing dishes. So anyway, <laughs> they started to send these to me and we put out a couple of books. I have them there somewhere. I don't know if I get my hands on them right at the moment, but... <clears throat> One of them is called Six Word Stories. And uh, so here's one of them right here. Uh, okay, good. And so anyway, I did a couple of those and people were buying them and so forth and having fun with them. And so then I started thinking, what else could I uh, do? So I thought, well, I think I'll start selecting some strange photographs. Just out of, just going, you know, on uh, Google and Google strange photographs or whatever. And so I started putting one or two of these on. Uh, Facebook each day, and I was just say, <laughs> "Here's your challenge for today: write six word stories." Well, this started, I don't know, six months or eight months ago or something. Every day, people are waiting for them. I mean, I put two of these on a day, uh -huh. and I'll get sixty or eighty, uh, you know, six word <laughs> stories out of each one of these photographs. And oh so, <laughs> and so, people are saying, "We appreciate so much you challenging us with this," you know. Uh, so they're they're doing it all the time, and. Uh, so uh, that kind of got them going on that. Also, I tried to write a couple of journals about how to do it. But anyway, the people started <laughs> getting excited about writing six word stories. Now, another challenge is 53 word stories. Oh and I do, have, I, do have some, <laughs> I do have some people that like to write 53 word stories, but I don't allow them any more, any less. That's exactly that. So, you know, uh -huh. so it's a real challenge. So <clears throat> I get a lot of feedback every day from my Facebook I get, uh, uh -huh. <clears throat> sorry, his stories. Oh, for sure. I know. And, and, you know, as I like, I like alliteration. And yeah. as I said, that's all where I was going with it. I had so much fun doing it. Yeah. And, you know, what a great idea to do something like this for, uh, I think this would be the makings of a great television show. That's what I think. It might do it. You want to <laughs> produce it and I'll try to figure out how to get it to work. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think we ought to promote it. And yeah. for our uh, audience, really, if you yeah. get a chance, go to Clyde McCauley at Facebook and join in the challenge. And when you see these pictures, they're, they're thought provoking. The they are, yeah. I, I try mean, to always find something that'll make them think twice before they write. Yeah. 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 Just finding the pictures uh, is a challenge in itself yeah, and yeah. then trying to figure out how to describe. Um, okay. Now let's talk about uh, poetry. Now mm -hmm. you are a poet and how did that come about? Were you always a poet or is this something new for you? No, it's something that I had never done until last year in my 80th year of my life. I, uh, <laughs> Uh, during the pandemic, I uh, was sitting out on our back deck. There was a nice deck out there, and the birds were in the trees and everything. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Sorry. And I was sitting there on the deck, and I was looking up, and I saw a gull, seagull. And he was flying. He got caught in an updraft. 
And he was going higher and higher, round and round circle, up and up and up, until he got so small that I could hardly see him. So as he did this, a poem popped into my mind. I mean, I don't know how. <laughs> uh, but it just popped in my mind. Okay. And so I ran in to get my computer, and I typed it out as fast as I could before I forgot it. And, <laughs> and it was about the seagull. Is he trying to find his freedom by going higher and higher, you know, and then it winds up kind of with, well, I wonder if he's ever read, read Chris Christopher's uh, song line, uh, freedom's only another word for nothing left to lose. Uh, um, so yeah. oh, anyway, yeah. so that was my first, my first poem. And then the next day I wrote what I think about George O'Keefe and the butterflies. Uh, I mean, and uh, uh, hummingbirds, sorry, hummingbirds. And then the third one, which became very popular, was one called The Sound of the Sun. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And what it is, it's, uh, do you have that right there? So, I, uh, I don't know what it is right now. Uh, the Sound of the Sun is, uh, oh, here it is right here. I could, I just want to read it to you real quick. Okay. So yeah, I'd, love, I'd love to hear it. Yes. <clears throat> here it is right here. Sorry. The sound of the sun. Lying in bed, he hears the sun rise. Forest full of trees, trees full of birds, birds full of song. He rises, feels for his cane, shovels his way outside to the warmth of the sun and the orchestra of birds. Turns toward the rays that he cannot see, opens his ear lids, and smiles at the morning. It's a blind man that can't see the sun rays, but he hears the sunrise. And wow. The sun, <clears throat> sounds of the sun. Well, that one's become quite popular. I, uh, after starting to write these things, <coughs> sorry, reading kind of gets me some. Uh, after starting to write these, I uh, joined a poetry uh, group of uh -huh. writers, writers and poets that uh, write their poetry. And so <coughs> I started putting my poems on this. And I now have over 17,000 readers worldwide <laughs> that are reading my Poems and these are writers and poisoners. I, mean, I have it on three different sites, but this is the only one that gives me the numbers of reads. So mm -hmm. I do know I have 17,000. Uh, how oh. I do not know. I've written probably 100 poems during this last year. Uh -huh. And my latest book is called The I don't know if you can see it very well The, uh, the 80 Year Old Virgin Poet. Yeah. <laughs> I love that title. And and I myself know that you just celebrated your 82nd birthday. 81st, 81st. 81st, okay. Yeah, don't make me do it. Yeah, I'm thinking of my husband. His 82nd is oh, this, yeah. this coming Sunday. Yeah. And I'm it, not that old. Yeah, yeah, you're so much younger than yeah, my so husband. much younger, yeah. <laughs> and, and it just goes to show you that... It, it's never too late to do something. And it's, you know, whether you're, I wrote my first book when I was 50, you're now in your eighties writing poetry. Uh, you know, it's encouraging for other people to hear our stories yes. and to know that you just have to sit down, pull yourself together and do it. And if, and I always say, if you think it, you can do it. And what is your thought on that? Oh, I agree with you. Uh, you know, as, as Bob Dylan one time I was read that he said, I didn't write these poems. He said, I just take my pen and pencil and the poems somehow flow through my brain and down my arm and write these out. He said, where mm -hmm. they come from, I don't know. And yeah. it's, uh, I was always thought that's kind of silly. But when you, what I experienced was, I didn't sit around thinking about how to get these things going. It just started happening. And I was writing one or two a day sometimes. And it happened, you know, for about six months. And now it's kind of dried up. Is that amazing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, we I had on the show um, two weeks ago, Tom and Gracias. And okay. he gave some writing tips, too, that I think are wonderful to share with our audience. And he basically said, when you're writing, don't try to be the editor. Just try to let the writing low and uh, God knows you'll go back and it'll be edited hundreds of times before it's published. But the important thing is to get the thoughts on the paper exactly. and, and somehow they'll just, uh, 
if you let your mind kind of go into a free flow, yeah. or I don't know, I think that's such great advice. Oh, I agree. I agree. I, I, uh, I don't, I don't edit it at all as I'm writing. I just start writing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I wait till I'm totally finished. And sometimes I go back and see things that are really miserably wrong, but most of the time it seems to flow pretty well. So I don't know. Can't tell you. It's uh, it's creative though, and it's magical. And uh, I used to have an old saying that said, "Sometimes the magic works, sometimes it doesn't." So yeah. <laughs> you know, I like it when it works. <laughs> and isn't it always a wonderful surprise when it works? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> right now, I want to share with my listeners my two volumes of priceless personalities. <laughs> These are all people who have been guests on my show through the years. And I've shared their stories in these two books, and I hope you will consider reading them. Have you ever met someone who was unforgettable? Someone who has touched your heart and soul? People who have faced difficult problems? People who have struggled to find solutions? People who fearlessly shared their stories? People who have not only informed you, but inspired you. People who have priceless personalities. I have been fortunate to host an internet radio talk show called January Jones Sharing Success Stories. And it has been my privilege to interview hundreds of guests. My guests have shared their stories, their struggles, their secrets, and their successes in their own words. In this book, we're talking about people dealing with problems such as incest, molestation, runaway kids, child abuse, drug abuse, polygamy, unemployment, scandal, and starting over. Then there are my guests dealing with difficult physical struggles such as blindness, cancer, and birth defects that are beyond traumatic. My guests have all been exciting, eclectic, and energizing. They have amazed, amused, and even astonished me. I have adored getting to meet them, and I adore sharing them with you. Attention all listeners, Priceless Personalities, Success Stories Shared by January Jones, Volume 2 is now available at Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle editions. You'll be able to meet 10 amazing people who will be sharing their own personal stories with all their struggles, successes, and solutions sprinkled with lots of humor and hope. Priceless Personalities features a teenager who becomes one of the famous Supremes from Motown, a nurse who has a humorist helps people to heal, an inspiring laughter yoga instructor, a mother dealing with the loss of a child, an incredible motivational speaker, a woman who married five times, a gifted paranormal nurse, a wise economist, a funny female humorist, along with an older man sharing his sweet childhood in the deep south. January's guests are all amazing and amusing. You will never forget meeting them. Go to Amazon.com for your own priceless experience. Welcome back with one of my very, very favorite priceless personalities, Clyde McCauley, who is featured in volume two, and he has written some amazing things. And now we find that he's become an 80 year old virgin poet. <laughs> yeah, I got like a 40 year old virgin, but I have 80 virgin poet. Yeah. yeah, I know. Well, well, anyway, whatever way, it's always good, I suppose, to be a virgin at something. Yeah, all right. Uh, now, let me ask you a question. Yeah. If you could have dinner with any famous person in the world, living or dead, who do you think you would invite to have dinner with Clyde McCauley? Oh, my gosh. Besides me. Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> well, you know, you always think of, your parents, you always wish that you could bring them back and have dinner with them one more time. Some more yeah. of mama's white gravy. But <clears throat> I don't know. I've never really thought about that. January. Uh, uh, oh, you know, I know who I'd like to. I'd like to sit down with, with uh, Robert Frost, the poet. <gasps> oh, my God. I've written a couple of poems about him. I visited his uh, farm in New Hampshire where oh. he and uh, we walked those same trails that he used to walk and so forth. And I've written one poem about uh, being on those trails and coming back in the snow and having okay. say, thought I saw him in the snow over there out there is almost, you know, a magical thing. Okay. So Robert Frost would be very interesting. I probably would, would hopefully be able to understand most of his words that he said, 
but mm -hmm. uh, he was a brilliant man and one that wrote about simple things. And I like that a lot. Um, I still remember uh, when he read the poem at JFK's inaugural and how touching that was for the entire country. Um, as far as a poet, he is incredible. He has been such a gift to the entire country and to the entire world, yeah. for that matter. Now, he was in New England, and you were raised, born in Arkansas, of yeah. course. And then you now, with your lovely wife, Susie, have settled in New England. How uh -huh. did that come about? Well, <clears throat> we uh, after I retired from uh, being a director of an art school, uh, we went up to visit a little island called Grand Manan Island, which is just eight miles east of the eastport of the Maine. Uh -huh. it's out in the island. It belongs to Canada. Okay. <clears throat> and so we have kind of fell in love with a little island. It's a bit fishing island, and it's about it's pretty big. It's 17 miles long and about mm -hmm. eight miles wide, seven or eight miles wide. And it uh, has about probably 2,500 people who live there year-round. Okay. And, you know, it gets up five, 6,000 during the summer sometimes. So anyway... Mm -hmm. We saw a house for sale right on the ocean. I mean, oh. an old house, an old 150 year old house. Oh and my so, gosh. <laughs> yeah, we saw, oh my, and it was at a decent price compared to Maine. I oh. mean, you know, so we thought we ought to buy it. So we bought it, and then not knowing what on earth we're going to do with this thing, we went home <laughs> thinking, are we out of our minds? You know? so, <laughs> anyway, there we were. But we decided we would go up and make a summer rental units out of part of it and uh -huh. another cottage or two. So, that's what we did. And yeah. so we yeah. wound up being up there every summer uh -huh. and we lived in upstate New York and that was too far to drive. So we thought Portland, Maine is a nice town. It's uh, kind of in Boston North in a sense. Uh -huh. And it's got lots of uh, culture and so yeah. art. And so anyway, we bought a condo in Portland, Maine for the uh -huh. winter time. And we would go to Grand Manan Island for six months during the summer. Okay. And so we did that. We had customers from Europe and all over the states and all over Canada, they came and stayed with us in our weekly rentals. We oh, rent. So anyway, once I got <laughs> sick, we thought, well, we're not too far from some of our kids here. So we just decided to move back to, to Portland, and that's where we we now have. Okay. That's so wonderful. You know, I, I was going to tell you that uh, when you can, you need to send me, text me your current address because I did send you a Christmas card this year and it got returned because I think I had the wrong address. So oh, yeah. I definitely want to get the correct address for okay. you. Well, I got it last year. Oh, you did. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. then I've got one for you coming this year. Now, um, okay, we're talking about retirement. Do you yeah. think we'll ever really, really retire? Well, we tire and retire and, you know, kind of mm -hmm. like the old, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I am kind of the point now where I'm almost housebound. It's kind of sad because, you uh -huh. know, as long as I'm just sitting here, I'm okay. But when I get up and start walking a half a block, I'm just uh -huh. exhausted, you know, and so. It's the oxygen um, thing. Yeah, the oxygen yeah. thing. So, yeah. because mm -hmm. I was a very active person mm -hmm. and it's very hard to, to not do it. So anyway, I've kind of found my computer i found creative, mm -hmm. creative works in my computer and yeah. i get you know uh, talk with a lot of people about three thousand people on my facebook list uh -huh. and so uh you know i'm just i'm just having fun doing that and yeah. you know yeah. still get down to the art museums and so forth once in a while but still in difficulty to do that now mm -hmm. well you know as your world gets smaller it also can expand because there's so much more technology that's available. And, you know, it's, I just have a marvel that we go out and do things all the time and a question will come up or something. And the next thing I know, my husband's on Surrey. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and we're, we're almost like these teenagers, yeah. <laughs> but isn't it incredible because you know, when we were growing up, if you wanted to do research, you were in the library for hours and it was just your whole life was spent doing research. Uh -huh. And now it's just pick up your phone and you can pretty much find out anything, can't you? Yeah, and, and you know what's amazing, January, is who is it that puts all these things on there? How many <laughs> things, how many things have I have written to put on, on Google? Yeah. Nothing. Who does this? You know, and you and my wife has a phone. She says, hello, Google. 
ask me this, you know, what time is this happen? And they, it is so much detail they can give you. Uh -huh. it's, ha yeah. it's like this. Yeah. And I can't believe it's real. But, I know. I know. And, and I have to say, it's wonderful. <laughs> yes, it is. And it is. And you have a library right in your home. Once you accept it and buy into it, it just makes your life so much easier, especially when we're talking about things that happened years ago. There's no way we're going to remember the details and we can just pull it right up. Well, and even your 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 show that you have right now. I mean, tw 25 years ago, you couldn't have done this show. No, no, not at all. I would I would not have been brave enough. <laughs> no, no. No, now we don't have enough sense not to. Yeah. And I think a lot of, I think, you know, uh, as difficult as the pandemic was for everyone, yeah. it was, I don't mean to minimize it, but it did have some wonderful uh, side effects as far as bringing the Zoom into our life and having people able to communicate. And uh, in some ways, that was a, a, a blessing, wasn't it? Yes. Well, Zoom is amazing. I mean, think about what, five, I don't know how long it's been around, five years, 10 years, probably mm -hmm. not even 10 years. And now, you know, all these people just get on and have the, all these meetings, you know, and I can meet a dozen people or whatever. And it's a, it's just, I'm, I'm flabbergasted by it, really. Yeah. yeah, me too. Me too. It's a wonderful time to be alive. Yeah. And it's a wonderful time to be in our almost 80s and 80 for you. And so, yeah, 80, yeah. <laughs> Okay, looking back, now I have one more question. Okay. Do you have any regrets or anything you would do over? I don't think so. I really I really don't think so. I I don't, no, I don't think so. I've I had a good life. I've enjoyed my life and uh, mm -hmm. I don't think so. I, 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 I really never thought about it, but I don't think so. Okay, well, I kind of, you know what? I kind of expected that answer from you. Yeah. <laughs> Because you've had a wonderful life, well lived, and uh, thank you for sharing it with my listeners. I hope they all have enjoyed our time together. Uh, Clyde and I have tried to be informative and inspiring, and my upcoming guests on the show will all be just like Clyde, eclectic, energizing, and exciting. Can I say one more thing real quick? Yes. Oh, I forgot this. They so can go on today. If you go to Amazon, Clyde McCauley Books on uh, Amazon, you can order my 80-year-old virgin poet book ebook e free for the next couple of days. So oh. you should people should do it. Last time we gave a book away on your show, I think I gave away 3,000 copies so oh uh, of another of my memoir. But now <laughs> go to Clyde McCauley. Just go to books on Amazon and type in Clyde McCauley. I'm <clears throat> sorry. And the 81, 80 year old poet, and you will be able to download an ebook on it free today and tomorrow. So please do it because I'd love to give you a book. Okay. You well, love reading my poems. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm certainly going to do it. And I hope that all my listeners uh, will do it. And thank you for entering the no wine zone with Clyde and I, and please share our stories and our show, show with everyone, you know, and remember stop whining start smiling. And if that doesn't work, then you can just sit down and start eating chocolate. Lots and lots of chocolate. Thank you. And we'll see you again next Tuesday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We want to thank you for listening to January Jones Sharing Success Stories. Always remember Ms. Jones' personal mantra, if you can think it, you can do it. That's what all of our guests have done with their lives, and so can you. You are the ultimate success coach in your own life. All you need to do will be to start sharing your own story with your family and friends. We hope that our guest stories will encourage you to explore an equation in your future that will combine your creativity, plus connecting with others will enable you to be successful too. Always remember, your passion plus your purpose will equal prosperity as you explore the wonderful world of January Jones.